anything happened, I can guarantee I'd do it again, and sooner or later I would kill another child. No, I would do it again. I've been molesting kids nonstop since I was 13 years old. How tough was it to go to the parole board two weeks ago? You looked scared to me. It was hot. And actually what ends up happening is he chokes her to death. He strangles her to death. Uh, one thing he didn't count on, though, is that there were phone records. Number four, Wesley Allen Dodd. Wesley Allen Dodd was born in Toppenish, Washington on July 3, 1961, and had a pretty normal childhood. Dodd had initially claimed that he did not experience any hurt, even though he and his brother both had their names recorded in history as criminals who preferred to commit crimes against the young. But he later described his childhood as a traumatic one in which he experienced physical and verbal hurt from his father. Their parents' marriage was anything but stable, and it culminated in his father attempting self-hurt following an argument with his wife on July 3, 1976, Dodd's 15th birthday. At the age of 13, Dodd began exposing himself to children in his neighborhood, which was brushed off as the boys will be boys mentality by his father. He progressed from indecent exposure to child hurt, a trend which continued well into his naval career when he was deployed on base. In 1987, Dodd tried to lure a young boy into a vacant building, but the boy refused to go with him and instead told the police. Prosecutors were aware of Dodd's history of offenses and recommended five years in prison. Times I think about what I've done, um, I think about some of the things the boys said before they died, and and that's real hard to think. Anything happened, I can guarantee I'd do it again, and sooner or later I would kill another child. Why do you want to be executed? Uh, I have to be. He was placed on probation and ordered to seek psychiatric treatment. After finishing probation, he stopped going to treatment and moved to Vancouver, Washington. Dodd's fantasies became increasingly violent over the years, and soon he acted on them. He lured two brothers, 11 and 10-year-old Cole and William Near, to a secluded area where they became his first victims. He went on to repeat the experience with another young boy, and his last attempt to kidnap James Kirk from a local theater on November 13, 1989, became his downfall. He was taken into custody by the police, where he was drilled relentlessly for three days, finally confessing to the three slayings. During the search of Dodd's home, police discovered a homemade torture rack, along with newspaper clippings about his crimes, a briefcase containing Lee, Isley's underwear, a photo album containing picture of Lee, and assorted photographs of children in newspaper and store catalog underwear advertisements. They also discovered Dodd's diary, in which he wrote in detail about the crimes. Dodd was put down at 12.05 a.m. on January 5, 1993, at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. His choice of method of demise had been hanging. Thus came an end to a life which had been useless in any positive way. Rather, it had been a source of pain and fear for children around him. No, I would do it again. I've been molesting kids nonstop since I was 13 years old. Uh, I will kill again. I've done it before, and at the time I liked it. How do you live with yourself daily? At times it's not easy. A few child molesters anyway are going to think twice before they do anything again. Number three, Wanda Jean Allen. Wanda Jean Allen was born on August 17, 1959, the second of eight children. Her mother was an alcoholic. Her father left home after Wanda's last sibling was born, and the family lived in public housing and scraped by on public assistance. At the age of 12, Allen was hit by a truck and knocked unconscious, and at 14 or 15, she was knived in the left temple. It was found that Allen's intellectual abilities were markedly impaired and that her IQ was 69. Found particularly significant, was that the left hemisphere of her brain was dysfunctional, impairing her comprehension, her ability to logically express herself, and her ability to analyze cause and effect relationships. It was also concluded that Allen was more chronically vulnerable than others to becoming disorganized by everyday stresses, and thus more vulnerable to a loss of control under stress. How tough was it to go to the parole board two weeks ago? You looked scared to me. It was hot. But, you know, the reason, you know, Jean likes for us to be present during these times of interview, remind her of things that um, she would like to say, and that's all about the brain damage, you know, and, and the borderline uh, mental retardation that she had. In our lives to happen so he can break us of ourselves and we be blessings to other people as well. Uh, it was more harder for me to see the people that love me go through what I was going through. I think about every day I have a birthday, that the victim's daughter should have been here with them today. By age 17, she had dropped out of high school, which was only the beginning of a dark journey. In 1981, Allen was sharing an apartment with Deidre Pettis, a childhood friend turned girlfriend. 
On June 28, 1981, they got into an argument and Allen shot and slayed Pettis. In her 1981 confession, Allen stated that she accidentally shot Pettis from roughly 30 feet away. However, a police expert testified that bruises and powder burns on Pettis' body indicated that Allen had pistol whipped her, then shot her at point-blank range. Nevertheless, prosecutors cut a deal with Allen and she received a four-year sentence. Another seven years passed before her second and last brush with the law occurred. Allen was living with her girlfriend, Gloria Jean Leathers. The two had met in prison and had a turbulent and violent relationship. On December 2, 1988, Leathers, 29, was shot in front of the Village Police Department in Oklahoma City following a violent catfight breaking out between the two women at their own home. Leathers passed away from the injury three days later on December 5, 1988. Leathers' mother had been a witness to the incident and the revolver involved in the shooting was recovered. Allen spent 12 years on the row. Her application for clemency was denied. While in prison, she experienced a spiritual awakening before she was put down by lethal injection by the state of Oklahoma on Thursday, January 11, 2001 at Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister. And it was like after then, I can't remember all that happened. It was like I was there physically, but not mentally. What I'm saying is at the time when I went to trial, they wouldn't allow me and my attorney at the time, Bob Carpenter, and they kept continuously telling the jury this person was timid and meek and never done anything in her life. And this is where I need to be on where I need to be. Out there, I didn't have the money. But you were carrying a gun. I didn't have the gun on me. Number two, Robert Fratta. They say that Robert Fratta was a deviant who was motivated by a messy divorce, a bitter custody battle, and money from an insurance policy. These things drove Robert to pay an 18-year-old trigger man $1,000 to slay Farrah Fratta, the mother of his three children, in 1994. Fratta organized the slaying for hire plot in which a middleman, Joseph Pristache, hired the shooter, Howard Guidry. I'm not being afraid to die. I think that's more of my relationship with God. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, I don't mind dying at all. She didn't meet the physical attributes of, of what I was looking for in, in a wife. He showed no remorse. He showed only the fact that he was full of himself, that he was cocky, that he could beat this. You learn to control your emotions. During the interview, that, that uh, he was not what we'd call freely forthcoming with all his information. Farrah Frada was shot twice in the head by Guidry in her home's garage in the Houston suburb of Atascosita. Robert Frata, who was a public safety officer for Missouri City at that time, had long claimed he was innocent. But justice caught up with him when his guns for hire decided to become witnesses at his trial. Frata was first sentenced to the gallows in 1996, along with his accomplices, but his conviction was overturned by a federal judge, who ruled that confessions from his co-conspirators shouldn't have been admitted into evidence. He was retried and resentenced to demise in 2009. During a 2009 retrial, the couple's children, who were then young adults, testified against their father, and Frada was convicted and sentenced to her end once more. After 26 years on the row, a judge finally scheduled his date of demise. The former Missouri City police officer was finally put down, making him the first person in the state of Texas to be done so in 2023. Bob thought he was smarter than everybody else, and he thought he was smarter than we were. Uh, one thing he didn't count on, though, is that there were phone records. I pulled the gun, gun up, and I shot him once in the head, and she, like, fell to the side. If he has any compunction towards guilt for killing someone, then they can exonerate themselves by having someone else do the killing. They shouldn't feel guilty. They actually did not murder the person. Number one, James Barnes. Born on April 27, 1944, in Detroit, Michigan, he was regularly mistreated by his alcoholic parents, with Barnes claiming that his mother had attempted to miscarry by ingesting a quantity of drugs. In another instance, he had been put in a sack and lowered into a well as punishment for misbehaving. He started exhibiting signs of mental illness early in his life and had to be treated in various institutions around Michigan, Tennessee, and Missouri for depression, hallucinations, and drug use. In between these treatments, Barnes committed a variety of petty crimes, with his most notable conviction being for a bank robbery committed in Detroit. After being released from prison, Barnes found employment as a factory worker for a General Motors plant, but was laid off after company sales went down. Left without a home or any close living relatives, he decided to move to Memphis, Tennessee, setting in the Nightwoods neighborhood of Parkway Village. From August to November 1988, Barnes would attack at least five prostitutes, three women and two male transvestites, around various neighborhoods in Memphis. 
three of these resulted in fatalities. The last confirmed attack occurred on November 5, when Barnes picked up 30-year-old Eric Lewis from 4th and Vance Avenue. It's just there's different um, personalities. Yeah, and for you. For me, huh, for, for me, uh, I appreciate it. You have observed that? I have observed that. You know, I've been, in December, I've been locked up for 13 years. Well, it was for a previous uh, conviction Correct. on murder charges. Correct. Yeah. He then drove to the rear of 674 South Main, where he shot him with his pistol. Like Thompson before him, Lewis's injuries proved non-fatal, and he survived the attack. Following the slaying of Thomas, the Memphis Police Department formed a special task force to investigate the recent slayings, which predominantly focused on interviewing various people for potential incriminating information. A major break came right after the attack on Lewis, when a witness claimed that they had marked down the license plate of the car that had picked up Lewis. When examined, it was revealed to be a gray Hyundai belonging to Barnes that matched the description of the supposed offender's car, seen in some of the other attacks. Several officers were then tasked with keeping watch of Barnes, and on November 10, he was arrested after a short car chase. The arresting officers saw him throw out a pistol during the chase, and when ballistic tests were performed on it, it was established that it was the same 32 pistol used in all five attacks. They finally had him, and all that was left were the court proceedings before this criminal got his just desserts. Simple, right? Not so fast. What stood between James Barnes and Destiny was an ocean of psychiatric evaluations, which concluded that Barnes did indeed suffer from mental disease, claiming that the psychiatrist had identified 12 distinct personalities with separate body language, mannerisms, and facial expressions. Barnes was detained in various mental health institutions until 1996, when it was finally ruled that even though he was indeed mentally ill, he understood the nature of his crimes and was thus eligible to stand trial. With his trial scheduled for September 1997, Barnes unexpectedly made guilty pleas on all three counts. As part of a plea deal with prosecutors, the penalty sentence was dropped and the charges were reduced to second degree. Instead, he was sentenced to 40 years imprisonment with a chance of parole after serving 16 years. Barnes was then transferred to the Lois M. DeBerry Special Needs Facility in Nashville, where he would remain under treatment until he served out his sentence. And basically, what he, is the sleeper held? Uh, where he took her neck and put it in the crook of his arm, and actually what ends up happening is he chokes her to death, he strangles her to death. That's all we have for you folks. Join us next time.